Huh? Kind of a funny video, but definitely kind of not, especially when you start thinking about it. Because anytime everything gets put in front of God, we're in a bad place, especially for us as believers. That's not where we want to be, is it? See, two weeks ago when we started the ABCs of Financial Freedom, we learned that everything is from God, and what we have is from Him. And so when He brings it to us, we need to make sure that He has part of it. But how can we expect God to be kind and bless us if we're like the guy in the video? Okay, God, you don't see me. I'm just taking it for myself. If we do that, we're in trouble. And um, the thing is, is a lot of people live just like that in their faith. They live like everything is theirs and really none of it's God's, not even a small part. But we want to make sure as believers, we make the choice today to say, God, what I have is yours. You are the one who gives it to me. And so I am giving it back to you. It's like the story of a man who went to the doctor and said, doctor, I have all these pains and I hurt all over there. And the doctor says, well, what's the problem? Well, the man stuck his finger out, and, and he says, well, it, well, it hurts here, and, and it hurts here in my knees and my back and, and my, my neck and, and, and my stomach. And the doctor goes, so you want the pain to go away? He goes, oh, doctor, I want the pain to go away. And he says, well, I, I see what the problem is. And the, and the doctor and the man goes, what, what? And he goes, I think I can make your pain go away. And he goes, well, what do I need to do? And he says, well, first, give me your hand. And he looked at the man's hand, and he goes, I see the problem. He goes, what is it, doctor? He says, it's your finger. The problem is your finger. It's all messed up. It's pointed to all these wrong places. What happens is when we look at our financial problems in life, we can point to everybody else with our crooked finger. And we can say it's somebody else's problem. It's somebody else's situation. But really, it kind of comes back to us. We're the ones that make the situations that we're in. When Pastor Paul was talking about the bondage of debt last week, we make those decisions. There are choices that we all make, and there are consequences to our choices. And we got to think, are my hands the ones that are messed up? It's amazing the choices people make when it comes to money. Now, a number of years ago, James Patterson and Peter Kim, they published the results of a national survey called The Day America Told the Truth. And they discovered what would people do for money. Here are some of the things people said they would do for $10 million. Now, this is kind of gut-wrenching, really. For $10 million, 25% of the people in their survey said they would abandon their family. For $10 million, 23 people in the survey said, 23% said they'd become a prostitute for a week or more. 16% said they would give up their American citizenship. 16% said they would leave their spouse for $10 million. 10% said they would withhold testimony and letting a murderer go free for $10 million. 7% said they would kill a stranger for $10 million. 3% said they would put up their children for adoption for $10 million. I know some people would do it for free, but um, that's, what this, that's what the survey said. The question is for you and I and the choices that we have, what would you be willing to do for $10 million? Some people think they can believe they can make any choice possible, and there's absolutely no consequences. But with every choice you and I make, Especially when it comes to finances, there's consequences. There's some good consequences and bad ones. Just like in life, there's good consequences and bad consequences with every choice. I exercise, I eat right, there's good consequences when I go get my physical, right? Um, for those of you who are in school or you're studying for higher grades, you study for your exams, you prepare, you know, you got um, some testing at, at work, you, you put in the time, good grades. For those of you who um, actually clean out your house, you know, or, or, or look underneath your bed and clean out your bed, you know, and you find things, you're like, whoa, I forgot I had that. Those are good consequences of doing something good. Well, in the same way, if I drive a little fast today and I get uh, lit up by the, the policeman, there's some get, bad consequences with the ticket. For those of you who are like, ah, summer's coming, right? But you forget to put on your uh, suntan lotion, then you get a little sunburn. And then a little later in life, you not only have sunburn, but you get to go to the dermatologist, right? Those are some bad consequences taking off some of those things. Well, there's good and bad consequences in every choice we make. But with God, some of those things are even greater. And if you and I want to change things in our lives, change things financially, we need to make some new choices. Turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1 through 10. Verses are also on the screen, and they're in your bulletin. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1 through 10. The Bible tells us about some choices every one of us needs to make. And for some of you, 
what the Bible says here through the wisdom of Solomon will represent new choices for you. Now, some of you, these are choices you've already made, and you're going to find the blessing in those choices be reinforced through today's message. But for all of us, these choices are some of the best choices we will ever make. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1 through 10. Reading out of the New International Version. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean on on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Verse 9, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. We can sum up with these, these verses, these 10 verses, and these three phrases, if, if you want to write these down in your notes section. The first is to remember what God says. And I will repeat this so don't get frustrated. Remember what God says, trust what God does, and honor who God is. Verses 1 through 4 tells us to remember what God says. When we read this, it says God's teachings are going to prolong our life. They're going to give you peace when you keep them on your heart. And they will bring you respect in God's eyes and man's eyes. So remember what God says, verses 1 through 4. Verses 5 through 8, trust what God does. When we trust in the Lord with all our heart, it's going to be a place where we can be at peace because we know he's wiser than us. You know, our brains (laughs) fit in this little space, right? I don't know. I think I have some extra space. I hear some rattling around every now and then. But God is wiser, and he is greater. And then when we come under his leadership, the Bible says um, that he will make your path straight. That actually means smoother, more successful. And then we will deeply respect him and turn from evil. And the third thing that we're going to concentrate on here today is verse 9 and 10. Honor who God is. Honor who God is as the provider of your life. Remember what God says. Trust what God does and honor who God is as the provider of your life. Today we want to focus on Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. And there's a choice here in verse 9. And it's pretty clear. Honor the Lord with your wealth. And it gets even more specific about how we do that. Give him the first fruits of your produce, the first fruits of what you do and what you work with and what comes out of your life. In the New Living Translation, it says, Honor the Lord with your wealth with the best part. When you think about the first fruits, this is the best part of everything you produce. You produce. So when you get your, um, your check and you're, and you're working hard or whatever you do, what's the best thing that comes out? Honor the Lord with that. God, you've given me, and I want to give back to you. If you choose to honor the Lord with your best, and you give him your first fruits, then you're honoring God, according to this passage, right? If you do not honor the Lord with your first fruits... If you don't say, God, I want to give you my best, then we're not honoring him and we're breaking his heart. If you and I are going to achieve financial freedom, we have to do a couple things. We're going to review the past couple weeks. Two weeks ago, we talked about we need to change our attitude. We need to change our attitude. We need to realize that God is the one that's in charge of how we get more, how we progress, how we advance in life. That God is the one that is in charge of our resources and he's the one that makes the call. Secondly, we need to avoid the bondage of debt. That was what we talked about last week. Avoid the bondage of debt. And if you haven't seen this yet in in your reading of the book, what does debt stand for? Debt is dumb excuses for buying things. D-E-B-T. Dumb excuses for buying things. That's what gets us into debt. Well, today we're going to talk about choosing to honor God with our wealth. Choosing to honor God with our wealth and with our money. And on the back of your Bulletin insert where it says the big idea. You want to pull that out right now? Right here for your big idea today. I want you to write this. Give God your best. Give God your best and he will take care of the rest. Give God your best and he will take care of the rest. It's a promise from him. Well, how can we give God our best? Going back to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. You honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits, and then he's going to fill things up. 
Well, what does it mean to honor? The Hebrew word honor means to weigh down. And when we give honor to somebody, think of giving honor to a king. What is the first thing you do? You give the king a big old crown, right? And then he's got a, a robe. And then he's got medallions. And he's got a scepter. And so when you're honoring the Lord, you're weighing him down with praise. You're weighing down with royalty. You're weighing down with honor. You're piling up the praise. This is one of the things we need to do as believers in Jesus Christ. When you honor the Lord, you're piling it up on God. You're declaring you are the king and you're crowning him. Now, obviously, we don't make a crown for God, right? But in our hearts, in our minds, we're saying, God, you're in charge. God, you're the one that knows it all. God, you're wiser. You're a whole lot wiser than I am. And so I'm honoring you in that. Now, we do a good job of honoring with our lips. Every weekend, we come and worship and praise, and it's a great thing. And, and one of the things we love talking about in our staff meetings recently is sometimes when, when Joe pulls back from the microphone and your lips give praise to God and, and honor, and, and we can hear the congregation singing louder and stronger and more encouraging. So we do a good job with honoring God with our lips. And then some of you do a really great job of honoring God with your hands. You serve. You serve behind the scenes, you serve humbly, you serve patiently, you meet people's needs, you say, God, I want to honor you. But have you ever stopped to think about honoring God with your wealth? What does that mean, to honor God with your wealth, to, to pile up praise? We can pile it up with our words, we can pile it up with work, but do we ever pile up honor unto God with our wealth? That means investing into kingdom things, investing into God's heart. What does God care about? When we care about what God cares about and we honor that and we pile up praise as far financially, God says, I will bless you. I will give you everything you need. I will fill up your barns and I will take care of your vats. I'm going to put resources in your life that you never knew about. Well, how do we give our first fruits? We take it off the top. We give God our primary stuff. We give God our best. You know, do we come ready each weekend to give God our best? See, what happens is that when you honor God and you give him your first fruits, you realize the skills I have, the abilities I have to create and produce wealth are not because I'm so great. It's not because I'm so skilled in my hands or I'm so smart. It's because I realize God gave me those gifts. And when God gives me those gifts, I give him back my first fruits, my primary, because I realize, God, I couldn't do any of this without you. You're the one that gave me these skills. You're the one that gave me these abilities. You may think, hey, I've got it going. You know, you come home from work, hey, I got the raise. I've got it going. Now, is it, do you have it going or did God give it to you? And do we want to humbly give it back to him? That's what we do when we honor him. We give him those things. It's an attitude of humility. It's an attitude of reverence saying, God, you've blessed me, but you gave me the gifts to be blessed. You gave me this job that's lasted so long. God, I've been, I've been passing through jobs here and there, but finally I've got one that you've locked me into. God, you've given me finances. God, you've given me inheritance. You've given me a blessing. This is something that I can honor you for. When we talk about financial freedom, from God's perspective, the single greatest thing you can do is to make the choice to start honoring God with your wealth. And then he will provide in ways that you can't even imagine. You may think, well, if I honor God with my wealth, he'll take care of me here and here and here. You know what? He's going to go beyond that. He's going to give you different ways of provision that you never even thought about. He will bless you and he will surprise you. And you're going to be like, oh, my goodness, God, I can't believe it. And you're going to be like a kid in the candy store, like, God, you, you did this. You did this, God, because you honored him. When you start doing that, it will be a blessing. See, we can play Monopoly, right? Or we can play the lottery, and we can try to live by chance. But you know what? We won't win. We won't win. The choice is yours. God wants to, he gave you a choice to choose to honor him. Are you going to believe in God the Almighty, or are you going to try to believe in the, the not almighty dollar? See, we believe in the not almighty dollar, and we hold on to that, and we think of the authority of the not almighty dollar. It's just a piece of paper that somebody gave authority to. But who is the ultimate authority? That's the one we want to give honor to. We want to give it to him. The Old Testament prophet Malachi takes what Solomon wrote in Solomon chapter 3 to a new level. In uh, talking about wealth and taking it a step further. He talks about how the nation who did not honor him were under a curse. 
But then he also talks about that nation when they take that promise and they hold on to it, that they will have provision and protection. Look in your bulletin outlines in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 through 12. It says, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decree and not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you, and he's talking about the people of Israel, ask, how are we to return? Verse 8, will a mere man, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and in offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me. God is throwing out. He's putting, in, he's putting it before you today. He says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop the fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed for you, yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. The prophet Malachi had to like all New Test, Old, Te- Old Testament minor prophets kind of had to wake up Israel. They were, they were off track. And he, gave, he had six different messages he had to give to Israel. And this is the fifth of the six messages. He says, you guys are robbing from me. You're being disobedient. You're not taking care of the temple storehouse. You're not bringing the tithes and offerings in them. And he says, return to me. Now, how would people return in this case? By bringing the whole tithe in the temple storehouse. Now, a tithe equals 10%. If you don't write, know that down, if you don't know that, write that down. A tithe equals 10%. It comes from the, you know, the root word that talks about being a tenth. Well, in the Old Testament, it was talking about the temple. In the New Testament, it's talking about the church. Now, offerings, when it says um, you need to bring your tithes and offerings, offerings are anything above the 10%. Anything above the 10%. So, for me and my family, when we tithe, we, we've always tied to the local church where we've been at, and then that's 10% or, or more. But um, offerings are something we do above. So like when we support missionaries, our missionary offerings are above our 10%. It's not part of our 10%. It's above. So Matt and Jessica Welchel, who are in Japan, um, who used to lead worship here, that's an offering above. Um, I support some other missionaries that, used to, that work with Katrina victims. And um, went down right there, and we're right there in the midst of uh, the hard times of uh, New Orleans. And um, now there are some inner city part of uh, Minnesota. They've they switched areas. Some of, many of you support um, orphans through Tumaini, through Kenya, our AIDS orphans. When, for us, that, that's an offering that is above your tithe. So when they're talking about tithe, that's 10% to the church, 10% to the storehouse of God. And then offerings are anything above that. And so I want to encourage you to think through that. Now, because they were not giving God his tithes and offerings, they were under a curse. They was, um, there was famines and there was pests that were taking down their um, crops. But for you and I, we're not growing those kinds of things, right? I mean, anybody, anybody got a vineyard in their backyard? No? We've, but we still have producing things. And so God, a curse is God standing against what you're trying to produce. Does anybody want God uh, standing against what you're trying to produce? You're trying to go to work. You want to have a good day at work. Man, it's Monday. Okay, God, it's Monday. I need your help. Do you want God standing against what you're trying to do on Monday or the projects you got to get done by Friday? No, you want God blessing you. You want God's help. You don't want God standing against you. But if we are not given to God, um, the Bible talks about in Malachi, a curse against people. Well, how are they return? In verse 10, it says we're supposed to um, give the whole tithe. That's all 10%. Now, some of you will think, have heard people say, hey, I like to progress to it. Maybe I can't do all 10% now. I do 1%, 2%. But you know what? The goal is 10%. And you know what? You will take God's blessing in that test right in your hand, in your heart, when you go right for it right away. Now, the conviction of all Not Avenue pastors, as we've discussed and we've talked about, is that giving starts at 10%. We've talked about it as amongst of us. What is giving here? It's giving starts at 10%. So the New Testament doesn't say a tithe literally. The New Testament doesn't use that language. But we believe that it starts giving, starts at 10% and can proceed from there. Now, what's the test we see in, um, when God says, bring the whole tithe that there may be? Um, food in my house, test me in this. 
God wants you, you to bring it. He wants, to bring you, he wants you to bring your faith. You think, God, I have faith. I have faith for this. I have faith for that. God says, bring your faith. Bring your faith. And test me. You know what? God doesn't say you should be testing. Even Jesus says, hey, you're not supposed to test the Lord. But this is the one place where God says, test me. And he wants you to test him. And he wants you to bring your faith and see if you've got it. Now, not too many of you are going to be called to build an ark. You know, God's not going to knock on your door. Hey, it's time, an ark. Hey, God, that's already been taken care of. But that was a test of faith for Noah, wasn't it? Not many of you are going to be called to cross the Red Sea. Okay, you're not, and God's not going to say, go down to the beach. From here to Catalina, I'm going to part it, but you've got to have faith. You're going to take everybody with you because I'm going to save you. No, that's not going to happen, right? Not too many of you are going to hang out in a lion's den like Daniel. Be tested for your faith to see if you're really standing for God. Those were tests of faith for great men of faith. But what is your test? Your test is to say, God, if I honor you as you say, and I bring the whole tithe, will you bless me? Will you bless me? God says, I will bless you so much that you can't handle it. Now, how many of you would like to have a bank account that you can't handle it? You'd be like, whoa. Now, we're not gonna, God's not saying it's going to be all bank account. God's not saying it's, it could be family relationships. It could be God protecting you from things. But God's saying, I want to bless you. Do you believe that God wants to bless you? God is putting that test on before you today. He's not saying build a boat. He's not saying walk across the Red Sea. He's not saying go into lion's den. He's saying believe that I will provide for you like you've never been provided for before. That is a test that God has for you. And what is the blessing of obedience? He's going to open the floodgates. He's going to pour out the blessings. Now, some of you are say, well, this is how I want God to pour out the blessings. I need this much. I need this much. I need this much. You know what? You and I are called to honor God. When we honor God, just put it in his hands to let him take care of the blessings. I don't tell God how to bless me. You don't tell God how to bless you. We just bless God. We honor him. And you know what? He'll take care of the blessings. And you know what? He'll do it a lot smarter than I will. I may say, God, I want this. And God says, I got a lot more than that. You're asking for this puny little blessing. I want to give you a greater blessing. How many of you want God's greater blessings? You don't want God's, you don't want God's to be limited because you only had a puny little vision. God wants to give you something greater. And so let God determine those things. And he will um, open the floodgates. And then one thing it says is he will prevent the pests um, from taking care of things that are yours. He will take, pre prevent you from being um, ravaged by inflation, by um, thieves. Now, I never thought about that because, you know, I've never grown anything. I don't have, you know, farms and, and vegetables and kind of that stuff like that. But God has shown me Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 through 12 in reality. Now, not many of us are growing things for our financial livelihood. But how many of you had to deal with termites in your house? Okay, if you have a house and you live in Southern California and you are paying for that house, you've got termites. And I remember the first time Malachi chapter 3 became a reality for me in the area of pests, God keeping pests away. Because as a tither, I thought, well, you know, I'm just giving and I'll let God take care of how he's going to have it. I'll give God my best. I'll let him take care of the rest. Now, we lived in a townhome. And we were part of six townhomes that were all linked together. And I had a neighbor who had some really bad termites. And he says, Mike, we've got to do something about this. If, if I've got them, you've got them. And if you've got them, we've all got them. And so what happened is we had to rally all the neighbors together because you can't just tent one townhome because when you share a wall, you know, together. So we had to get together. And we had to have a tent over six townhomes at one time. And the thing is, is my neighbor, he had been doing all this work. And he actually had some experience in the extermination field. And so he was already, he has already over $1,000 just into wood and in replace, road replacements in his home. And he was doing the work. And so he did just over $1,000 just in wood alone. Well, the, the company that did our tenting also had wood replacement. And so each police um, house, each townhome had to have wood replaced before they would tent. So he was doing his own. And then they came and did mine. And then they did my neighbors. And then on down the line. Well, my neighbor on the other side of me, sharing a wall, two stories, over $2,200 in termite wood repairs. My neighbor had over $1,000 into it in wood alone. When they did it, Mars, $600. For the first time ever, Malachi chapter 3, I said, God is preventing the pests from my house. He's sending the termites over to my neighbor, 
And he sent him back to him. I said, well, what the name? I don't know how God does that. You know, maybe he's got the little termite joystick. You tie this week, we got him. I don't know how he did that, but Malachi chapter 3, he prevented the pest from my house. And you know what? He did it again in our recent, in our current home, in our association where we live. Now we live in a patio home where we don't share walls, but to get a new roof, we had to have um, wood replacement for the new roofs. Well, they did our neighbor's home. I had a neighbor who had over $2,500 of wood repair in the roofs before they can get theirs. Ours was less. It was, it was $980. So it was, you know, one and a half times less. And, the, and the, the roof worker kept going, I can't believe how much less wood that you have repairing in your house. Is it because we're any greater? No, it's because there's a God who pro- provides and there's a God who prevents pests. And he will take care of that. Now, I'm not sure what the pests are in your life. It could be appliances. It could be your cars. Now, we're not talking about people, we're, okay? We're talking, you know, that's not the kind of pest we're talking about. We're talking about things that devour your wealth, okay? But God promises protection. Now, Dave Ramsey in his book, How to Have More Than Enough, says, if you're not tithing, giving God the first 10% of your income, start today. Make giving the first check you write at the top of your budget. Have you considered that perhaps your fail to honor God off the top of your income is one of the reasons you've been struggling financially? Some of you are saying, like, I can't believe this, this tithing stuff. This is crazy. How am I supposed to give 10% away to God? I can't even pay my phone bill. Well, we all have to make a choice, folks. Do I bow down to Verizon? Do I bow down to AT&T? Or do I bow down to Jesus Christ? That's the choice we have to make. We have to choose. Now, some of you are saying, hey, Mike, everything you said so far, that's Old Testament. We believe in the, Jesus and the cross. That's, we're under a new covenant. And you're right. We are under the covenant and rules of Moses. We didn't have any animal sacrifices today. None of you hooked up 12 cows you know, or, or, or bulls, said, hey, I had a real bad week. I need to do a lot of confessions. You, know, you didn't bring 12 bulls you know, to take care of all your sacrificial and forgiveness needs. We are under a new covenant. But we have one perfect sacrifice one for all time that's greater, and that we don't have to worry about imperfect sacrifices. And the New Testament expectations for us as believers is even higher. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says, Do not think I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill them. Jesus met all the expectations of righteousness. And then in verse 20, a couple of verses later, he says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. What did Jesus mean by that? Because, see, he raised expectations. The religious leaders of the time, they can do everything outwardly so that you can say, hey, you didn't catch me doing this. You didn't catch me breaking this uh, commandment. And they can do everything on the outside to look good. But what happened was inside their hearts were hard. Their hearts were mean. They didn't murder anybody, but they did a lot of hating. They didn't commit adultery, but they did a lot of lusting. They, you know, they didn't, um, you know, come out and punch out their enemy, but they sure didn't pray for him. Jesus raised the expectations for us. He says, your your righteousness needs to go beyond the Pharisees. It needs to go beyond the outward conformity. It needs to be a righteousness of the heart. Standards of purity that God wants. But if you want to look at a New Testament example, look at Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Jesus affirms the blessing from God when we give. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give. And it will be given to you, Jesus says. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, we poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Jesus tells us, if you give, I will give it to you. God will give it to you. And other people will give to you. This is giving to other God, giving to other people. It says, it will come back to you. It sounds like making the choice to honor God we saw in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. If you give, God will take care of you. When it says a good measure, that means, you know, whatever you, you're measuring cup. Is your measuring cup just a little thing or is it a big basket? Whatever you're using to get it, um, God is going to fill it up. And he says, press down. He's going to fill it up. He's going to press. When he pours his blessing into your life, he's going to press it down. He's going he's to make sure that there's no empty spaces. He shakes it. He presses it down. He shakes it. He presses it down. He is going to... Fill up blessing in your life. This is shaking together, running over. And see, all of a sudden, if he starts pouring so much blessing into your container, whatever your container is, your container of faith, he starts pouring so much blessing, 
you know, we today, if we had a cape, you know, a container and it was overflowing, we'd be trying to catch it, pour it in something else. Maybe we'd grab some off the top, stick it in our pockets. Well, they didn't have pockets back in. They had robes. So when it says being poured into your lap, what happened was it's like after your container's being filled, they press it down, you fill it up, press it down, fill it. all of a sudden they would lift up their robes and they'd like it'd be poured in their lap. They're like, okay, I got to scrape off the top. My container's full. And, you know, you're, you got it in your lap. And you're like, I, got I don't want to waste any of this stuff that God's blessing me with. God says, I will do that. If you give, I will take care of that. Now, the key thing here in verse 38, look at that last phrase. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So if you only want a little bitty blessing from God, just a little bit, that's all you need to give, just a little bit. But if you want all of God's heart, all of God's blessings, all of God's grace. If you want God's grace in your life, you give graciously, right? If you, but it says the measure you give, it will be given to you. How I give will determine how it shall begin to be. Give God your best, right? And then he will take care of the rest. Now, when should we give? 1 Corinthians 16, 1 to 2. Now about the collection of the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian church to do. On the first day of the week, each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Paul told the churches in Corinth and in Galatia, plan ahead in your giving. Don't just say, hey, what do I got? What's my spare change? You know, what do I got in my pocket? Plan ahead in your giving. Now, Paul never uses tithing, and it's not used in the New Testament, but he says, give in keeping with your income. It sounds like it's proportional giving to me. And if Paul is a, um, a Pharisee, and if he knows the Jewish law, and he knows the proportions of the Jewish law, he's probably thinking along those same lines. He never says tithing for sure, 10%, but he knows proportional giving, keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections have to be made. Now, again, there's a collection at the very beginning in verse 1, but he says that no extra collections is what they're talking about. No extra collections. Now, one thing you'll never have happen at Not Avenue Christian Church, that I've talked to people from this church that said they've seen it in other churches, you're never going to see the offering go around two and three times. I heard that at some churches when they take the offering, the people in the back will look at it, the deacons and the elders, and they'll say, mm, not enough. So they bring it up to the front and say, okay, you guys, got to give again. So that's what they're talking about. If we give to honor God the first time, we're going to never have to have the second and third collection, okay? But we want to honor God, and there will be a blessing. Now, I want to end here with Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. What are all these things? Well, in verses 25 through 32, right beforehand, Jesus says, I'll take care of your physical needs, what you need to eat. I'll take care of your clothing needs, what you need to wear. I'll take care of your needs if you put me first. If you seek his kingdom and his righteousness, he will take care of your needs. If you give God your best, he will take care of the rest. Now, personally, from the beginning of my life, I took Matthew 6, as a promise as a new Christian. If I just take God, put him first, I'll let him worry about the rest. I'll let him worry about the rest. And he has blessed me. He has blessed in many, many different ways. Um, Maybe it's why I was able to drive my VW Golf for 19 and a half years, 14 and a half without car payments. Some of you have been around long enough that you remember me driving that little blue Golf, okay? And uh, it never had any engine problems, never had any transmission problems, it just kept going. Now, it wasn't the coolest car, okay? I mean, I know some of you really wanted it, but it wasn't the coolest car on the road. But it was transportation. God says, if you put me first, I'll take care of your needs. Did I have a need for transportation? Yes. God took care of that. 14 and a half years. How many of you like to be going without 14 and a half years without a car payment? Would that be kind of cool? Some of you under car payments right now, you're like, ah, okay. We got another car right now. It's about 50, almost 15 years without a car payment. Um, well, 10 years without a car payment because we've had it 15 years. But 14 and a half years. It wasn't flashy. It wasn't the coolest car on the road. It, it didn't have rims that spun, okay. But... God met my need for transportation. And when you put God first, he will take care of things. He'll keep the car pests away. Now, you have a choice. You can live life by chance, maybe by the lottery, by something that's going to happen, or you can live by choice, a choice to honor God. 
And here's what I know. There's not a chance that you'll ever take that will be as good as honoring God. When you honor God and give him your best, he will take care of the rest. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that in you is the best sacrifice, the best love, the best way to live. God, you make a promise to us, and you want us to test you in this. And Jesus, you reaffirm this, that if we give, you will give. And you do so much more. You're so much wiser. You're so much more gracious. You're so much more loving. You're, you know what the best is. God, I pray that we'd be a people who would trust you. That we would make a choice today to honor you. Not only with our lips in praise, which is what you want. We bless you in that. Not only to honor you with our hands in, in, in service. But Lord, we want to honor you with our wealth. Because God, you say that if we do that. If we heap piles of praise, even with our wealth, on you, that you will look after us. You'll take care of our needs. God, I don't know how you're going to do it in every situation, but God, you will do it for your glory. I pray that there be some people in this congregation today that would step up in faith, that their Red Sea crossing would not be through water, but by trusting that you'll take care of them financially. Or that the, the, the big boat that they're going to build would not be with hammers and nails and wood, but it would be a, a chance to trust in you to provide in a way that they've never seen before. Father, I pray for your blessing upon my brothers and sisters that they would trust and honor you. We pray this in your name. Amen.